I'd like to talk to you this afternoon just uh, a little bit about a topic I call spiritual heroism of the Holocaust. And certainly it's an emotional topic. However, I'd like to do a little bit of an analysis and hopefully from that analysis we can draw out some deeper conclusions as to perhaps what the purpose of the Holocaust was, why Hashem brings suffering in general on Klai Yisrael. But I do ask everybody for such a discussion that we do put our emotion on the back burner and we make an effort to try to listen to what I will be saying. Because obviously when we discuss something like this, it is a, a naturally, and it should be, it's a very emotional, very emotional topic. First of all, I just have to say, you know, when I was growing up as a kid, so I was always asking myself a question as to why you, we didn't find much resistance during the war. You know, maybe we would speak about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and it was, a, it was a glorious uprising. There was no question about it, and there were definitely groups that did fight back physically, but there were few and far between. And I, I guess the word that seemed to float around in the time period was like sheep to a slaughter. And it was a very upsetting term. And it wasn't until maybe, I guess, about 20 years ago or so, I think that I noticed it at least, maybe in the market, in, 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 in literature and books, the realization that people were publishing their experience in the Holocaust and their heroism during the Holocaust, but it was heroism of a different nature. It wasn't the heroism of fighting back with a machine gun against tanks or with a pistol against an army. It was a heroism of fighting back with a spirit and fighting back in a way that only a Jew can fight back, which is very unique. I saw a story, Mike Tress, a famous activist in America in the 1940s. He actually, a very, very well-known individual who did so much for Kleisrael. After the war, he went to the DP camps in Europe, and he did it to see what was happening and to find how funds can be used properly. And of course, many Jews we know were in these camps after the war, no place to go. And he gave a lot of chizuk, strength, to many people. He writes, or it's written in his biography, that in this camp, he met a man, and it was very unusual, because it was actually a Rebbe, a Hasidic Rebbe. It was a youngish man, but he was the Rebbe to a certain dynasty. And he had a long beard. And it was very surprising, because to meet a Jew in the DP camp, the deportation camp, a Jew who went through the war did not have beards. Because, you know, either you were, you were in a place, either you were hiding, in which case you had to look like the non-Jew, so you had, you had to cut it off, or you were in a place where the Nazis forced you to cut it off. But to have a beard meant, and a long beard, meant you had to have given it time to have grown. So Rabbi Mike Tress came up to him, and he said to him, I, you know, I see you have such a beard like that. You know, can you explain? How did you survive the war with such a beard? So he said to him, he said, in Yiddish, he said, Ich bin ein Partisan. He I'm a partisan. He said, really, you're a partisan? Partisan, you fought with the, the Russian partisans, you fought with the Polish partisans, you fought in the forests? He said, no. He said, there's many ways to be a partisan. He said, I was in hiding. But I was a partisan because I said, no matter where I'm going to be, I'm not going to cut my beard. I'm going to look like a Jew even in hiding. That was my way of resisting. That was resistance. He said, Ich bin ein Partisan, I'm a partisan. I saw that story and I realized there are many ways to be a partisan. There are many ways to fight. You can fight physically or you could fight spiritually. And I'd like to show right now what the spiritual resistance was about. In order to get there, however, let's take a just a, a quick look at the model for a Holocaust and understand what why Hashem might bring such an event. Of course, when I say such a thing, I'm not claiming to know the answer. All I'm doing is I'm investigating Jewish sources, and by investigating it, let's draw conclusions from what we see. Our sages always point to Mitzrayim, to Egypt, as a model for all anti-Semitism. So if we look at Egypt at a just a cursory two-minute analysis, what do we see? First of all, we see that the first thing that Joseph says to his brothers when they come down to Egypt, 
after the years of separation, finally the brothers are coming down to Mitzrayim, to Egypt, and Yosef meets them, and it's a very, very warm reunion, and one would expect in such a reunion that Yosef would tell them, listen, I have a place for you to stay now, you're going to be living here, I want you to take a shower, and you know, it's a long journey from Eretz Yisrael to Mitzrayim, not like today, you know, relax, get set, and tomorrow morning we'll decide what our future is going to be in Egypt. Joseph doesn't do that. First thing Yosef says to them, first thing he arrives, he says to them, listen, I want to send you all to Goshen. Goshen was a place where apparently very good for pasturing sheep, and the Egyptians worshipped the sheep god, so this was not a place which they normally would be at. So I want to send you to a place where you won't have the problem of interacting too much with the Egyptians. That's the first thing he tells them, which is interesting. Then Joseph brings the brothers before Paro, and he wants his illustrious brothers now to meet the king. And he says to Paro, these are my brothers. They're all shepherds. Now in Egypt, by the way, to be a shepherd was a very, very terrible profession because the, you know, the sheep is a god and you're the guy who takes a stick and has to hit their god? It's a terrible thing. Shepherds were, you know, were, were, were anathema to Egyptian thought. He said, these are my brothers. They're all shepherds. You know, you can imagine such a scenario. It's like if um, a plane of Russian Jews arrived, I don't have anything, no, just happened to be, let's say, a plane of Russian Jews arrive in Israel and a family gets off, and this person comes to the, the minister of absorption and said, listen, I'm from Russia. In Russia, we had a billion dollar industry, and we want to apply our billion dollar industry now to the Israeli economy. So the minister of absorption says, wonderful, that's fantastic, what do you do? He said, we were in racketeering and profiteering. <laughs> he said, gambling, alcohol, cocaine trafficking, and we as a billion dollar industry. We want to apply that now to your country. So the ministry of Zorshi would send them back. Here they come down to Egypt. They say, guess what? These are our brothers. They're shepherds. Oh, what's Yosef trying to say? He's telling Paro, send them away. Don't keep them hanging around here. Get them far away from the Egyptians. Now what happens? Life goes on in, in Egypt. And <clears throat> a few words hint us off as to what the Jewish experience was like. It says, V'yeshev Yisrael B'yaretz Mitzrayim, B'yaretz Goshen. It says that the Jewish people dwelled in Mitzrayim, in the land of Goshen. V'yachusu ba, v'yifu v'yobo b'yod. And they acquired possessions, and they increased and they multiplied. Interesting. Yachusu, the word to acquire actually doesn't mean possessions. Yachuzu is a word that you learn, you use when you acquire land. Achuzu. Apparently they began to buy land in Egypt. And the wording, if you know a little bit of Hebrew, it says Vyachazuba, which could be read the land acquired them. Which is kind of interesting. Because if I if a person if you're in exile and you feel that you have to pick up from your exile at any moment, do you invest your money in precious gems? Yes. gold, or in condominiums in Florida. I dare say in precious gems and gold. Why? Because you feel you have to be on the move. You have to be ready to go. But it says, They started possessing, or the land possessed them. They started being very comfortable in their natural setting. And then the Pasuk says, V'yirbu ba'od bimyod. And they started increasing very much in something called mi'od. You know what does mi'od mean in Hebrew? Mi'od means very, very much. But if you say mi'od bu mi'od, what does bu mi'od mean? You can't increase in very much. Sometimes mi'od is a noun. You love the Lord your God. With all your heart. Which means your, your wealth. That which is used to get more is your money. Money has no value except to get more. That's why it's called mi'od. It says, v'yirbu mi'od bimi'od. They started getting very rich and started acquiring real estate. Now, the Jewish nations get very comfortable in the land. Now, it's very interesting. 
towards the end of the book of Genesis, the last parsha is called Vayechi. It begins Vayechi Yaakov Yaretz Mitzrayim Shavas Roshonim. That Yaakov lived in the land of Egypt Shavas Roshonim. That Yaakov lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, and at his death, Yaakov was 147 years old. Now, what's very interesting, if you look at the Torah, there's always a space between parshiot. Either a parsha will begin on the next line, which is called a psucha, or a parsha will begin nine spaces later, which is called a sasuma. That's the way it is in the entire Torah, except for one chapter, the chapter of Ayichi. This describes the death of Yaakov. The Torah goes straight from Parshish Vayigash, one space, space, and begins Vayichi. So our rabbis are perplexed by that. Why did Hashem change the system? Either you need nine spaces, or you have to start on a new line. Why is there one space between Parshish Vayigash and Parshish Vayichi, which talks now about the death of Yaakov? So our sages and Rashi brings it, say that, uh, that Hashem is trying to teach us a very important philosophical lesson. That something was sealed. You know, when you have a one space between something, there's no room. He said that the death of Yaakov, their eyes were sealed. They were closed, susum. They couldn't see clearly. You know, when things are very close together, you can't see. So God purposely writes Parshish Vayechi with one space to teach us philosophically that the eyes of the Jewish nation were closed to the suffering of what was happening, were closed to the Egyptian persecution. There's only one problem. We know that when Yaakov died, Yosef at that juncture, we know that Yosef was 17 when he came to Egypt, he was 39 when Yaakov arrived, and he was there 17 years. So Yosef was 54 when Yaakov died. Yosef died when he was 110. And the persecution didn't begin until the last of the brothers died. And Yosef was the first of the brothers to die. That means there was another, how many years? 56 years until, excuse me, 54 years that Yosef was going to live. Yosef was 54 now, he's going to live to 110, right? Someone do the math for me over there? Right? 56 years. Another 56 years that Yosef is going to live. And if we think that each brother maybe died three, four years after each other, let's talk about another 30 years. The persecution isn't going to begin to maybe 80, 85 years later. Yet right now the Torah is saying that the eyes of the Jewish nation were blind, were blinded. So our rabbis comment to say, the people weren't blinded to the persecution but they were blinded to the cause that was going to bring the persecution. What was the cause that would bring the persecution? I hate to say it, but it's assimilation. They had become so Egyptian-like that they were feeling comfortable. Let's buy property. Let's invest. We're here to stay. 86 years before the persecution began, they were blind to the cause. Very fascinating. Then the persecution begins much later. Now, even during the persecution, we know that the Jews did three things, and through those three things, they had the merit of being redeemed. What were they? They didn't change their name, language, language or the dress. So Chazal says it wasn't so simple. Apparently, as the persecution intensified, the rabbis made different decrees. As it intensified, they said, okay, look, we've got to start speaking Lashon HaKodesh, Hebrew. As it became... More intense, they said, look, we got to dress Jewish dress. As it became more intense, they said, look, we got to keep Jewish names. In other words, it was a response to the persecution because they understood that the persecution is a function of assimilation. This is a Jewish thought, a Jewish makshava. It might be hard to hear, but this is Judaism. For some reason, God wants us to be unique and special. He wants us to be a special nation. He wants us to be a holy nation, a nation that's capable of being a light to the other nations. To do that means, of course, that we have to live differently. When we absorb the culture of the host country, we can't fulfill our purpose. So it's interesting, what Hashem does is Hashem will allow, will bring, I should say, anti-Semitism, persecution, in order to bring us back 
to who we are as Jews. Let's fast forward history to 1934. And let's take a look at some other anti-Semitic laws that were brought against the Jewish people. And of course I'm referring to the, the Nuremberg Laws of September 15, 1935. We don't have to be great historians to understand that the rate of Jewish assimilation in Germany was probably the highest in all of Europe. If there is a 65% intermarriage rate today in America, statistics have shown there was about a 50% intermarriage rate in Germany before the war. The leader, Avram Geiger, had made a statement in the 1800s already saying that we no longer need Tisha B'Av. Why are we mourning the destruction of Jerusalem? Berlin, Berlin Yerushalayim. Berlin is our new Jerusalem. The irony of such a statement, of course, goes without saying. But I want to ask everybody a question. If we're Torah Jews, and we believe that God gave the Torah, we believe that God gave us a purpose to be a light to the nation and there requires that we be a special nation, a holy nation, a nation that does not like, act like the other nations. And now, we're, now imagine we study our Parsha, we learn our Torah, we see that if we analyze the Egyptian persecution, we see as the Jews assimilate, persecution intensifies. What do our sages do? Our sages need to say, look, you have to counter, keep your names, keep your dress, keep your language. You know, very interesting, with a 50% assimilation rate, intermarriage rate in Germany in 1935, the new Reich adopts laws called the, called the Nuremberg Laws. Let me just read you a few of these Nuremberg Laws. First of all, number one, it's forbidden by penal servitude for an Aryan to marry a Jew. That's interesting. Penal servitude, imprisonment for an Aryan to marry a Jew. Not only that, every Jew, and I'm reading, are the different, I'm reading it out of order, but I'm reading, I have a copy of the different articles printed out from the internet. Another article states that every Jew is required to add the name Yisrael or Sarah to their name. So if your name has been, you know, Heinrich von Lichtenberg for the last uh, 50 years, your name is now Heinrich Yisrael von Rittenberg. And if your wife's name was Gertrude von Rittenberg, she's now Sarah Gertrude von Rittenberg. Interesting. Now what's so interesting about this is, if we look in the Gemara of Odazara, it says that Shammai and Hillel both agreed on what we call the 18 ordinances, which were designed to make sure the Jew doesn't assimilate. And many of those things we do keep. For example, we shouldn't, we shouldn't eat the, the bread of the non-Jew, lest we come to drink the wine of the non-Jew, lest we socialize with the non-Jew and therefore intermarry with the non-Jew. There were 18 edicts that were set out by the great rabbis Hillel and Shammai. And it says, they stated, they tell us prophetically, that if the Jew can't keep these edicts himself, the non-Jew will force us to keep these edicts. If we can't recognize that we're special and different, the non-Jew will remind us that we're special and different. So I'm just asking everybody to think, how would, if you're Torah learners and observers, what do you say when you see those Nuremberg laws? My gosh, the Reich unwittingly is bringing us back to Judaism. And look how far it went even. I just want to read to you from a Zionist newspaper which stated at the time of one of the at one of the boycotts of Jewish stores this was April 1st 1933 we know that Hitler and his henchmen were sending boycotts boycotts around Jewish businesses so a Zionist newspaper which was not a religious newspaper in fact, there was a Zionist newspaper which had an anti-religious agenda. Writes the following in one of his articles, April 1st, 1933. And I quote, Hitler set up guards in front of Jewish shops to prevent people from purchasing from Jews. 
The shops were forced to close on Shabbos. Thus, in effect, Hitler intentionally ordered that the Jewish shops be closed on Shabbos. This event aroused even liberal Jews to self-examination. Many of them remembered Shabbos and streamed to the synagogues. Is it any more than right to see this event as the finger of God? Teaching a lesson which should be learned for all time? Zionist newspaper, 1933. Hitler brought us back to keeping Shabbos. I can't do business. I might as well go to the synagogue. I'm going to put that on the table as something we have to think about and understand. That our reaction to anti-Semitism is never a reaction of this is, this is insane, this is irrational, it is irrational, but we should understand the irrationality is directly brought from Hashem. Hashem uses anti-Semitism to remind us that we have a mission, to bring us back to who we really can be. Now, I'd like to say that during the war, during the Holocaust, the more one studies the literature, the more one understands that the Jew was brought back to who he really is. The Eben Ezra says something very beautiful. He says, the purpose of life is to love. That statement doesn't mean much in English because love doesn't mean anything in English. But in Hebrew it means a lot. Because the word ehov means I will give. That means that the purpose of life is to give. To resemble the Almighty by giving. And if I can resemble the Almighty through giving, God is a giver, I'm going to be a giver. I can make my soul more like the Almighty and thereby be capable of being in a relationship with the Almighty for eternity. Because I'm, I'm more like Him. I can relate more to what I'm like. The purpose of life is to love. Ahov, I will give, is to give. I saw a story in a book that transformed my life this year. And I know Shoshana is going to say she knows the person. It written by a woman in Israel called Sarah Rigler, called The Holy Woman. And she writes in the beginning of this book, there's a woman who, Chaya Sar Kramer, who survived the Holocaust, not only survived the Holocaust, she, she was in Auschwitz. She had been used by Mengele, Yimak Shemo, for experiments. She survived. She thought she was going to die. She ends up in Eretz Israel and she lives. She marries a, a very, very great individual, not capable of having children, but living a life of, of, of tremendous giving. In fact, I met these people about 20-something years ago, not, knowingly, not knowing who they were, thought, thinking they were simple farmers who lived in the north of Israel. I didn't realize who they were until I read the book. And the woman who writes this book says that she had a very amazing encounter with her. One of her first encounters was, they were sitting together, and this woman who wrote the book, Sarah Rigler, a well-known writer, she states, so I could state it, she had been in an ashram for 12 years. In ashram, she was very immersed in Hinduism, studying in an ashram. Apparently in the ashram, a rabbi found her and discussed Judaism with her, and, and she realized that she was deficient in her knowledge of who she was, and decided to go to Israel to, to study and to learn. Eventually she became a very, very righteous Baal's Tshuva and lives in the old city of Yerushalayim. But at this time she's speaking to this woman, Chaya Kramer, Chaya Sar Kramer, and she's telling about the ashram. So Chaya Sar Kramer says something to her, says to her, I have to tell you something. The ashram where you are for 12 years, that was a bad place. He says, I know. Auschwitz, on the other hand, was a good place. So she looks at her. I, you know, I, I know religious people are, you know, have a lot of, that doesn't make any sense to me. What do you mean Auschwitz was a good place? And she said back, when you were in the ashram, 
You spent 12 years in meditation and reflection. But it was all about you. It was all about your relationship with this spiritual being. All about your spiritual inside. It's all about you. When we were on the train going to Auschwitz, I made sure that I learned the Yom Kippur to Philot. Because I was concerned that the other girls who were with me didn't know it and we would not be able to dive in Yom Kippur. There was another girl next to me. She worked on memorizing the Megillah at Esther. So if we're going to be there during Purim, we'll be able to read the Megillah. While we were in Auschwitz, we lived for each other. If you live for each other, wherever you are is a good place. The ashram was a bad place. When I read that story, I understood what the Ebenezer meant. Life is for love. The purpose of life is to be a giver like the Almighty. And wherever we are, if we're in a position where we can give to another, it's a good place. Because we have the opportunity to resemble the Almighty. The more we look at the Holocaust, the more we discover the way the Jew conducted himself in the most horrendous situations. But it was always as a Jew. The definition our rabbis tell us, the Gemara in Yuma, excuse me, in Yivamot, that if you meet someone who claims to be a Jew, but he does not possess the qualities of Rahmanus mercy, by Shonus shame, or he's not a Gomel Chassadim, he doesn't do kindness, you have to question whether he is from the seed of Avram Avinu. What should come out in a Jew, when squeezed, should be acts of kindness and love and dedication. Now I want to give you a few examples of this. I know we're pressed for time. There's a wonderful sefer by a Lithuanian rabbi who survived the war, of Ashroy. And in English, it's called Responsive from the Holocaust. In Hebrew, it's a six or seven volume piece called Mina Mamakim. And basically, Rav Ashroy was in the Kovno ghetto, and the Germans, in their iniquity, wanted to keep a library as a showcase to what they destroyed and made him the librarian of the Jewish library. So he had access to the svarim, to the books. So questions would come his way from other Jews as to what to do in different situations. Since he had access, he could look to Paskin and answer off the questions. And he wrote down a lot of these responses in his, in his seven-volume work. And one can still buy it, I think, in English, called Responsive from the Holocaust. I'd like to share with you just a few of these questions that he received. One I thought was very fascinating. Apparently, in the ghetto, starvation was the norm, as we know. But they were able to smuggle in a small cow. Now, this cow, of course, would provide benefit to as many people as they could. An undernourished population needs the nutrition. They had a question. The question was as follows. We have shochtim in the ghetto. We have people who could do the ritual slaughtering. That's not a problem. To slaughter ritually, we know we have to sever the esophagus and the windpipe in one full, uninterrupted line. We have shochtim who could check the animal, but there's another problem. We know before we can eat meat, we have to salt it. There's no salt in the ghetto. So one possible solution was, well, we can roast the animal. Because, you know, when you cash your liver, what do you do to remove the blood when you cash your liver? You broil it. And by broiling it, you drain out the blood. There's only one problem with that. If people would eat roasted meat, the stomachs, which had already been shrunken by the famine, couldn't absorb it. So he, so he passed in another solution. So we have to boil it. But this is how we have to boil it. We have to make sure that there's always going to be 60 times more water than the meat. Because we know when you have 60 times more of something, you can 
nullify it, right? We know that these are laws that we have. If you have your delicious chulant and Shabbat and some milk falls in it, as long as the chulant is 60 times more of the milk, it's kosher. So he said, every time they cook a piece of meat, they have to measure to make sure that there are 60 times more water than meat. And this way they were able to provide a, broil, a, a broth that more people would be able to benefit from and less people would be affected negatively. Now I bring that just because I was fascinated by it because what do you see? You see Jews starving in the ghetto. They have access to food. But it's not just a question of I'm going to eat now to satisfy my physical need. I'm going to eat now in order to serve Hashem. I'm going to serve Hashem even under such a situation. I'm going to give to the Almighty. I'm going to allow my neshama to have opportunity to give to. Let's take a few more questions that we saw over there. A interesting case came up in such situations. A very fascinating case. A life and death type scenario. And I'd like everybody to think about it. Imagine that you have been chosen to be the 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 Altenstadt, the elders in your particular ghetto. And the Germans give five thousand white cards and they say, You decide who gets a white card. Whoever doesn't get a white card will be deported to Auschwitz. You know that whoever you give a white card to will be saved. Whoever doesn't get a white card is facing an almost certain death. Are you allowed to choose to whom you give these white cards? Because by giving a white card, are you sending somebody else to their death? Or can you say that, well, right now, it's as if we're all in a situation where death is imminent, and therefore we're just trying to save people from imminent death. That's a question that we can hear. Can you give such a white card? Seems to be the halacha is that as long as it was not specified who the Germans wanted, one can give 5,000 cards away to allow other Jews to, to escape. Whereas the halacha would be different if specific Jews were specified and you're substituting those Jews for somebody else. One cannot substitute. But when it's, no one has been designated specifically, one can choose who you want to allow to escape. Now, I bring that because I think it's fascinating to see the way a Jew can live in the most trying of circumstances. It's not enough just that we have 5,000 possibilities to allow 5,000 Jews to live. We can only let 5,000 Jews live if they're living properly, if they're living following the will of God. That's a nation. That's a nation unique to no other nation. At the Nuremberg trials in 1945, 46, we know that many Nazis were given prison sentences, many were hung, some were hung, some went free. But I'd like to read an account by a German engineer, Hermann Grabi, who witnessed the massacre of the Jews of Dubno in the Ukraine. And this German engineer described what he saw as the Germans were massacring this group. And this is his testimony at the Nuremberg Trials. Without crying or tears, these people undressed, stood in family groups together, kissed and said goodbye, and waited for a sign from another SS man who stood by the trench and also held a whip. During the quarter of an hour that I stood near the lorries, I heard no crying or begging for mercy. I watched one family of some eight persons a man and wife, both of about 50, with their children, about 1, 8, and 10 years old, as well as two grown-up daughters of 20 to 24, an old woman with snow-white hair who held the one-year-old child in her arm 
singing to him and tickling him. The child chuckled with joy. The father and mother looked on with tears in their eyes. The father held a youngster of some ten years by the hand and spoke quietly to him. The boy fought back his tears. The father pointed with his finger to heaven, stroked his head, and seemed to be explaining something to him. The SS man at the trench called out something to his comrade. The later detailed 20 persons and told them to go behind the man of earth. The family of whom I spoke was among them. I remember exactly how a young woman pointed to herself and said, I'm only 23. I went over and looked at the mound. People lay in so closely packed that only heads could be seen. By my reckoning, there were about a thousand people in this trench. The people went down a few steps which had been dug in the wall of the trench and scrambled over the heads of those who were lying there at the position that the SS men indicated. They lay down among the dead or wounded. Some stroked those who were still alive, speaking quietly words of comfort to them. Then I heard a succession of shots. This non-Jewish engineer was testifying to how Jews died. One could be cynical and say, oh, that looks like sheep to the slaughter. Or one could be honest and say, no, it looks like the Shamot reacting to Hashem. Living to comfort, living to give, living to shield at the last moment of one's life by families who weren't trained in the art of violence or war. Accounts of Russian, the Russian army camps where the same things would happen. You see Russian soldiers, men trained in the art of warfare, hardened soldiers, crying and screaming and fighting to, to get out, pushing and then killing. Yet Jews giving and embracing and trying to shield others from the horror, even at the last moment. That's spiritual heroism. And God brings us to these situations because He understands the Jew is so important. Our job as a Jewish nation is to teach the world that life is about love, that life is about giving. If we can't teach the world that, there's no purpose for existence. We have to be that light. But if we're going to give up that job, and if we're going to become like the other nations, and if we forget who we are, God will bring the anti-Semite. He will bring it to remind us of who we are. And He'll squeeze us. But by squeezing us, the real Jew comes out. And I dare say that's the literature we find right now of the resistance in the Holocaust. You have to look, it's difficult to find acts of physical resistance. It was hard. How can you resist when you have families and old people with you? But that's not real resistance. Real resistance is being a spiritual partisan, looking to serve God even in the most drastic situation. That's what anti-Semitism can bring out. That's certainly what the Holocaust brought out. It brought us who we are as a nation. It defined us as a nation. And our legacy to that event is to live like such a nation. Thank you for listening.